All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a look at the example problem for projectile motion. I have an example problem right here, um, and uh, we're going to break it apart using the video of the po uh, post-lab discussion of projectile motion that you guys just should have watched right before this. If I were you right now, I'd read the problem. I would pause it. I would just try to draw some graphs. I'd ask you to draw the x versus t graph. I would ask you to draw the y versus, or I'm sorry, vx versus t graph. Um, I would draw the y versus t graph, and I would draw the vy versus t graph. Um, you will note that your graph might look a little bit different depending on how you, or where you put your origin, which is your zero, zero mark, or your two positional axes. Um, and we'll talk about those differences in a second. So just try to draw those graphs, get a rough sketch of it. All right, so um, first things first, I know that I have a ball that is being shot at 10 meters per second, and it's at an angle of 20 degrees. First things first is I want to draw on my axes. And remember that these are my positional axes. This is Y positional axes and this is my x positional axis. Um, what I did was I actually put the ball so it is at 0, 0. So I know my initial position in the x direction is equal to 0. And because I know things about projectile motion, I know that this object is moving at a constant velocity. It's going to the right, so we have positive velocities. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that bit. The other piece that I have is my Vx versus T graph is actually a constant velocity as well. This again echoes the graph right before it because we just said that there is no acceleration. So this shows no acceleration at constant velocity. My Y versus T graph should look something like this. Again, notice that my initial position in the Y direction is equal to zero. And so I'm going to start at zero. I'm going to have this ball go up and it would come back down like so. Um, the other situation is that this object does have an initial y velocity. How do we know that? Well, if you take a look, this ball is being thrown to the right, and it also is being thrown upward. And so you can see that both there is an x and a y velocity um, initially to begin with. And how would we solve for this? we would do so Kato, and we're going to get there in just one second. So that's my initial velocity in the y direction. And again, the slope of this graph is equal to negative 9.8 meters per second. How do I know this? Because we are on Earth, and we are, um, it acts as an object in free fall um, in the y direction. So that would be the graph portion of this. Um, you'll start to notice the graphs give us a little bit more of a visual, because when we are looking for it, when it reaches its max height, it would be right there. And what do I know about an object when it reaches its max height? You'll notice that that is corresponding to when my velocity in the y direction is equal to zero. That is at some time t. Well, what's interesting enough is that time t is going to be exactly related to this graph, because that's the same time it takes for it to move that far. or hit that velocity right there. So you'll see we, we can use the same routines that we've done in Unit 2 and Unit 3 in order to solve this. Um, the next best thing that you can ever do when solving one of these problems is just split it up into the x and y directions. And so you'll notice every time that I do one of these problems, I have a t-chart which talks about what's happening in the x direction, what's happening in the y direction, remembering in my head that they are completely independent. What happens in the y direction is not going to change what happens in the x direction. So for this problem, uh, for this portion of the problem, um, we first off know the initial velocity in the x direction and the initial velocity in the y direction. How do we know it? Well, just remember that we were given that this is 10 meters per second. And so using good old SOKATOA, we can start to solve for v naught x and v naught y as long as we have the angle, which we do. So I can say the cosine of 20 degrees is equal to v naught x time, or over 10 meters per second, which, while solving for v naught x, 
all that you have to do is to do 10 times the cosine of 20 degrees. And when you do that, you get 9.39 meters per second, which if you take a look at is 9.396, which we are just going to call 9.4 meters per second. Um, in order to go um, v not y, we do the sine of 20 degrees, and that is equal to v not y over 10 meters per second. And to solve for this, again, we do the same thing, 10 times the sine of 20 degrees. And we get 3.42 meters per second. So v naught x, we can say we solve for 9.4 meters per second. v naught y is equal to 3.42 meters per second. Um, in the x direction, I know that my ax is equal to 0 meters per second. That's good. Um, in the y direction, I know my final velocity in the y direction is equal to 0. That is when it gets to its max height. That's a good sign. And what else do we know? Oh, in the y direction, we also know that my acceleration is equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared. As long as you're on Earth and close to the surface of Earth, that will be true. And so whenever you're in this situation, one of the things that you should be looking for is getting three things that you know. In the x direction, it's a little bit trickier because if you remember from the prior video, we want to use this equation. Um, the reason why we want to use this equation is because that whole term will always go to zero. And you're left with delta x equals vx times t, or v naught x times t. And you'll notice that delta x is going to be how far the object moves in the x direction. vx we do know, which is 9.4 meters per second. The problem is we have two unknowns. We don't know time for this. And so when we get into this situation, we're like, we don't know time. Guess where we want to get time? We want to get time from the y direction. And so looking at the things that I know here, you're going to notice that I can, um, I can get that time looking um, before. Or I'm sorry, looking at these three things. I go, oh, hey, I know an equation that can get me time. Um, it's vy equals at plus v not y. And so what we could do is we could plug those things in. We can solve for time, and then whatever time we get there, we can go plug it in back on over there in order to get delta x. So you'll notice what we're doing is a pretty standard situation where um, you're given a question, and you basically want to find time, because once you know the time it takes for it to get to that height, that's this guy right here, you can start to solve for a lot of things. Um, first things first, let's actually go through this problem. The x velocity in this situation is going to be that right there. So that would be part A. The x velocity, when it gets to its maximum height, guess what? It's going to be the same velocity as it was when it originally started in the x direction. y velocity, when it gets to its max height, is going to be that value right there, 0 meters per second. Why is that? Well, if we go back here, when it's at its maximum height, you notice that, well, let's go back. Nope, just kidding. Um, you'll notice that it hits a zero velocity in the y direction. X velocity, notice that it's still the velocity that we had from before. Um, except, um, oh, and then total velocity. Total velocities at this case will be what's happening in the x direction what's happening in the y direction, and putting those things together to look at the final velocity. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is very similar to what we have here. Technically, that 10 meters per second would be the total velocity. The x velocity would be here, and the y velocity there. So total velocity just refers to that hypotenuse of the triangle. Um, you notice that our x velocity in this case would be 9.4 when it's at its maximum height. The y velocity is equal to 0. So you're going to notice the hypotenuse of this triangle would actually just be the velocity v um, because the triangle would go from here to here, and it would actually give you that velocity at that point. Um, so we have that. That would be these three here. And then the range and the height. Range of this thing is going to be how far has this object moved in the x direction. So as this thing flies through the air, the range would be how far has it moved here? 
and that would just be calculating this, um, why does it keep moving at me? Would just be calculating this change in position, or what you could do is you could calculate this area. What we've done is we've actually calculated doing that equation right there when we plug into time. And then height, height is going to be as the change in vertical position. That is going to be known as when it starts here and goes here. Um, or it could be known as the area of that piece right there. You would calculate that by looking for using these three things. You would want to calculate delta y. So I challenge you guys to try this. Take a shot at it. You're going to get some practice on this tomorrow with the sub. And then we'll take a closer look at it um, on Thursday. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.